Hello, friends. Welcome once again to another episode of Strange Planet, and it is a far stranger planet than we can imagine. And if you'd like to get deeper into Strange Planet, please consider becoming a premium subscriber. It's real easy to do. Just click on the link in the episode notes, strangeplanet.supportingcast.fm, strangeplanet.supportingcast.fm. You gain access to commercial-free listening, special bonus episodes, produced exclusively for premium subscribers. And you also receive a free subscription to my monthly newsletter, Inner Sanctum, strangeplanet.supportingcast.fm. On this episode, we are going to meet a, a real live sir, Sir Blake Sinclair. He's uh, also a, a mystic uh, who's had a lifetime of paranormal experiences. And uh, he's also the author of uh, three books, a trilogy, if you will, uh, Dare to Imagine, 18 Principles for Finding Peace, Happiness, and True Success, Beyond Imagination, A Path to God and the Divine Realm, A New Beginning, An Antidote to Civilization. Sir Blake Sinclair, welcome to Strange Planet. How are you? Pretty good, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. So you... Um, you are, as I mentioned, an, a, a, an actual sir. You are the Grand Knight Commander of the Royal Equestrian Order of Michael Archangel. Yes, that's um, right. Okay, so tell us about that. Well, I um, I met Prince Gerios uh, last year, and he's a lineage that goes back to the Gassadid dynasty, which goes back thousands of years ago. And they were known as the Christian kings of the Middle East. And uh, I've been following him on Facebook. We, we have a lot in common with art and martial art and even Buddhism. And uh, there was a kind of a charity fundraiser. And, I, and we we're both going there. And I said, to, I sent a message to him. I said, hey, would you like to meet up? Thinking that there'll be no response because I haven't talked to him before. And all of a sudden he responded that, yes. So I met him at this convention fundraiser for a museum. And then we, we talked and had a really good talk. I gave him some of my books, and a month later, he had his chancellor contact me. They offered me an opportunity to be a knight. So I was I knighted. I worked really hard. And so there's different levels of knighthood. So I started, you know, as a knight commander just to build up the Northern California. But I guess I, I hustled and worked really hard. I got promoted to be a grand knight commander. So it covers the whole California and the southwestern states. I'm also the goodwill ambassador at the Royal House of Gassan as well. The Royal House. What what country is this uh, from again? Uh, I think well, they're recognized by Lebanon and parts of Syria. Mm -hmm. but, uh, they go way back in Middle East before, so he's a basically Arabian prince. Oh wow, wow! And it's, order, it's, a it's a humanitarian order for help, helping humanity, especially in the Syrian area, Lebanon. But his goal is to kind of help all all around. He's systematically the prince is systematically working on uh, bringing hope and love and support to people who need it. And it's a Christian order? Well, it's originally was Christian, but it is open to all, all religions. Like the, the prince himself studied Buddhism for like 30 years. So I mean, you don't have to be a Christian to join. There are Buddhists who join and people from all faith. So it's, it's open. It's, it's all about love, supporting people, and uh, working together and having fun. All right. Sounds good. Sounds like a, a, the kind of... Um organization I'd love to be associated with. Let me ask you about your father, who was a, phot a photographer yes. with the U.S. government and um, had um, quite a, um, a background with uh, Roswell and, and so forth. Tell us about that. Yeah, actually, I, I never knew that uh, until late in life, but I do know that my dad used to listen to Art Bell Radio. He talked about paranormal very good show, and uh, one day I was watching a UFO program about Roswell, and he was behind me smoking. He said, you know, I was there. I said, what? Are you kidding? He said, I was there. And I, I always knew he did something in the military. He worked at White Sand, New Mexico, mm -hmm. not too far, and during that time period, in the 1940s. And he did a lot of photography stuff, top secret. So I know in his room, he had a picture of a V-2 rocket, which was retrieved from the Nazis. And uh, they would do things like film it and take pictures and so forth. And uh, I think one day he was developing pictures when his buddy said, the picture you're developing, it was from the crash. And he was all excited. And after that, I guess someone talked to him and he, he was silent. They couldn't talk about it anymore. 
in fact, my, my dad was silent about it until late in life. And, uh, and probably said, well, it's time to share this information. But that's all he said. He didn't say too much that he developed that picture. Did he? Um, did the Roswell crash. Did he see alien bodies? You know, when you do top secret things, they have certain ways of doing things. So when they develop it, I don't know if he flipped it over. I, I, I'm sure he probably did, but he wouldn't tell me. He's, he's kind of a loyal person and he's, he's a very conservative person. I'm sure when he did it, he, he peeked at it. But um, yeah, that's my guess. But just being that, uh, just knowing that he was part of that, it was very exciting because it has a correlation with me, with my own life, with this kind of extraterrestrial phenomenon. And it seems like it's kind of a lineage thing, you know, and why was he there to develop these pictures? And why did I have my experiences? And why am I connected to people who have these experiences? There has to be a reason. You you um, have an abduction story when you were young? Yeah, when I was young, I was, uh, I was at a farm, I think it was Fairfield. And I was like missing for an hour. I don't remember anything about, you know, missing, but I remember coming back to the farm, but there was like time in between for an hour, I was gone. And I don't, I don't remember at all until one day when I was studying hypnosis and through the hypnotic process, I began to see myself with these uh, aliens. And interesting enough, the teacher was a psychic. She tuned into my regression and she's like, uh-huh, what did you see? And then I told her, she validated it. I, I saw that already. So that was fascinating. What did your um, this was a um, like a, a regret a hypnotic regression that you underwent? Yeah, I, I took a class on uh, past life uh, regression. So instead of going to past life, I went to my early childhood during the abduction experience. And what else do you remember from it? Do you remember <clears throat> what the entities looked like? Did they um, perform? I don't know any experiments. What happened? No, I don't remember that part. I just remember just being escorted. And they were very tall and uh, kind of um, slender and big eyes. They, they, they look kind of, I guess, like Asians. So they were like praying mantis almost. And interestingly enough, since the childhood, I've been fascinated with the praying, praying mantis. And there is a species called praying mantis. Yes, yes. Um, did you have um, past life regressions as well? I mean, I know you regressed to your childhood to remember this abduction, but what about past life? regressions yes i've always been fascinated by hypnosis so one day i decided to do a past life regression uh, i think the guy's name was george delong i was just doing it for fun we, we sat down he put me in hypnotic uh trance and all of a sudden we went through this uh dimension and he was very good it's hard to do hypnosis uh you have to be careful what you say because you can plant seeds of yes to kind of bias the uh, viewing, but he didn't do that. So he let me kind of see what I wanted to see. And then he asked me afterwards what I saw. And what I saw in my regression is that I was uh, in Egypt and I was living some kind of palace or something. Very simple. It was out in the desert. So I was a prince. It sounds kind of funny, but it, I was a prince, but I gave that life up because I was not happy with that life. And I became a healer. So I left that life and worked in a sleeping temple for many years. And it's interesting, I scanned through that lifetime. At the end of my life, I died and I could see my soul leave my body. Interesting enough, I was met by an extraterrestrial being. Now it was a different kind. I don't know the species, but it had small eyes, but it was not human. And he kind of took me to the next dimension. So I remember that vividly. And that was my first experience of that. So it was not until many, many years later that my dad told me about his connection with the Roswell incident. Hmm. Um, other UFO experiences in adult life? Yeah, yeah. I've, I've, uh, in fact, I sent you the video. I, I, you know, I saw like a UFO at uh, Sedona. They, they have a lot due to the fact that they have a vortexes there. And uh, I captured, I think it was like 10 to 20 seconds of a video footage. And it's, uh, it was very erratic in its flight pattern. And so I, I think I've seen it twice in Sedona, uh, probably once or twice at Mount Shasta. They tend to go to the kind of uh, places where their vortex is, sacred mystical places. Well, speaking of Mount Shasta, um, 
you sent me a photograph. Um, I believe you took the photograph. It's um, a light being. It's oh, light being. <laughs> okay. along the road. Yeah, that's that. I, I didn't take that picture. A friend of mine, he's a, a shaman, a, a Vogel shaman. And uh, Stan Lee calls him one of the superhuman. He's an amazing guy, a great healer. He goes there and has mystical experiences. He captured that picture. And it is said that at the base of the mountain, there are a civilization. The people, some people believe it's a Lemurian. Some people believe it's something else. But to actually have a picture like that is kind of amazing. Uh, Mount Shasta is a mystical mountain. Many refer to it as the root chakra of the planet. Some say it's the heart chakra because it's a volcano, volcano dormant one. Other people, some spiritual masters say that at one point, there were some Tibetan monks that brought some uh, artifacts and put it there in Mount Shasta. And I visited one of them, the uh, stupa, and they anchored the energy from Tibet, Mount Kailash, to uh, Mount Shasta. So it's, according to one master, the energy from the Mount Kailash is transferred over to Mount Shasta, being the root chakra, and the root, not root chakra, but the crown chakra, and the sh distributing the energy to the rest of the world's chakra. So, but whatever it is, it's a sacred place. People from all over the world go there. You know, they have Buddhist masters. You've got very spiritual people from Europe, everywhere. They go there to congregate and to experience this mystical mountain. I've been there so many times and I had my first encounter with the ascendant masters on that mountain. And uh, a lot of many mystical experiences there. Tell me about these uh, ascended ma masters. This was on top of the mountain? You, you... Well, you, don't, you don't get to go there. You go to a certain point. There's like a bunny flat. That's the first level. You park your car, walk around. If the weather is good, you can go further up, pet the meadows. If the weather is really good, then you, you can hike up. But most of my mystical encounters uh, happen, I think, at the uh, bunny flat, the first level. Not very high. It's like maybe a 30-minute drive. Real easy. And uh, that kind of started my mystical adventure. It all started when I was connecting my friend. His name is Joe Ego, the one that uh, gave the picture. Mm -hmm. He's a great healer and a sh shaman. And we did a lot of work there. He taught me about uh, Reiki healing. He's a Reiki master. And it was beautiful. He brought me to the point higher up, I think, Pat the Meadows. And he, he used a beautiful Vogel crystal wand, a huge one. It's like he's like mighty Thor holding this thing. It's like over ten thousand dollars. Very powerful. Wow. Use it for weather shamanism, and he worked on me. And uh, when he did that Reiki with that wand, it opened all my chakras. A beautiful, beautiful, vivid color. But at the end of it, I looked at the sun. It was bizarre. It had a beautiful violet ray just came out of the sun right towards me. I said, like, "Wow, amazing." After that, I noticed. I, I followed him on Facebook. We were friends. And I saw this guy, this guy, this guy had a white hair. He looked very distinguished, but the energy came out to me and said, contact him. So I did. And his name is Peter Mount Shasta. Turns out he's a, a famous uh, uh, guru, spiritual teacher. Turns out he's the apprentice to uh, Saint Germain. Saint Germain made an appearance on the mountain. He's an ascended master, a person that's been living before, who attained liberation, which means they break that karmic cycle so they can go between dimensions from the in the realm on the other side and back to the physical realm. And he communicated with uh, um, Godfrey Ray and taught the uh, I am teachings. Are, are you familiar with that? No, no. Yeah, those are sacred teachings that empower humanity in this in this new age and uh, empowers humanity to make a bigger difference on the planet. So I just sent him an email thinking nothing about it. And all of a sudden, I said, would you like to meet? And he just said, well, sure. I didn't realize that it was hard to meet him. I, I know people who live there are trying to get a hold of him and they, they can't meet with him. So we met at Lily's restaurant at Mount Shasta, had a nice little breakfast. He invited me to his place nearby. And like a week or two before I, I met him, I was getting these obsessions with turbans, Indian turbans. Usually <laughs> Sikh people wear turbans. I don't know why I wanted to buy it. It'll do ABA. I said, oh, let me see all these turbans. And my wife said, you're crazy. <laughs> <laughs> But when I went to his house, looking around, he had all these pictures. I said, who are these people? He goes, oh, these are Senate masters. I said, oh, okay, cool. I was kind of new to this. And there was a picture of this guy who had a turban. Mm. Interesting enough. And we were talking, we were talking. And all of a sudden, he stopped. 
he paused and he was like, he's got a message. And then he, then we start talking again. Then he got another message and he got two messages. This guy, this, this ascendant master was the Maha Chohan. He said, the Maha Chohan is waiting for you. I said, the Maha who waiting for me? Where is at Mount Shasta? I said, you kidding? Where do I go? Said, you just go there. I said, okay. So I, I just said, did my farewell. He's a wonderful master. He's very famous and well-known. And so I, I just went to the mountain. It was a very dark day. It was like uh, snow around the road. And it was very, it wasn't a good driving condition. So I went as far as I could, and which was bunny flat. There was a couple of people there, real dark, couldn't see the sky. And soon everybody left because it was too dark. And I started walking around. I said, where the heck do I find this guy? And I saw this huge footprint. I said, oh my God, is this Bigfoot land? <laughs> or a big bear? Am I going to be eaten alive? But I said, if they wanted me there, I guess um, they'll protect me. So I started to meditate. That's what I needed to do. I just was guided to just all of a sudden just meditate. And all of a sudden, my right ear activated at a very high frequency. And then all of a sudden, these ascended beings, they appeared. It was the Maha Chohan, Saint Germain, and the Kuan Yin and Jesus. They were just there kind of above me. They didn't say anything. They just did an attunement. They, 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 they sent something to my consciousness. It was like, it was like a activation. It was like an initiation. So I was in that state of uh, initiation for a while. And then when it was done, suddenly the frequency just went away. I found out years later on, that's considered a clear audient ear. I didn't know that at the time. It was the first time I had that experience. And I looked up, and all of a sudden, the whole sky was clear. I mean, there was not one cloud. It was completely blue. So that was a kind of auspicious sign that I just had this... Uh, Kind of an amazing uh, mystical experience and that was the birth of my mystical journey and your clairvoyant abilities began at that point it wasn't clear clairvoyant i mean i had visions of uh, masters but it's the first time I mean, uh, that they actually worked directly on me but this is a, the point when masters start coming to me you know through the years different masters would visit me and they guide me the books they're not written for me I, I get guidance, I get downloads of wisdom. And if I don't write it, it drives me crazy. So I have to write it. And when it's finished, it, it stops. Just like the frequency. So I just sit and listen. Sometimes it would be coming in my sleep when I'm driving. And it happens so much so fast that I sometimes have to get a recorder. And when it comes, I just record it, I say something. But through the years, many different masters from around the world, ascended masters have been teaching me. Uh, Kuan Yin, Buddha, and the latest was uh, Ananda Mahima, or Sri Ananda Mahima. She's a, an Indian known as the uh, Avatar. She's an Indian saint, and she was born fully realized. She didn't have to study anything like most other saints had to go through her training. She didn't. She was born speaking already. She had the wisdom already, and she was respected by people from all religions. And she passed away, you know, many years ago. But she visited me uh, two years ago in a visionary dream. I don't usually have those kind of dreams, but she came to me and specifically told me to contact this guy who I, I, I contacted. I mean, I was friends with him on Facebook, but, you know, very superficial. I just knew he was a musician. You know, that was it. So she said, you know, you need to study with him. You need to listen to his music. It was known as Kirtan music. And that way you can learn about me and my love and learn about her. So I contacted this guy and had the dinner with him. Turns out he was a direct disciple of her. And he was uh, Acharya Mangananda, a, a kind of a prestigious title, meaning that he could teach her te teachings. He was the right person, you know. And the thing is, I don't know about him. And all of a sudden, this mystical experience. And apparently, she does that. She picks people she wants to work with, and she'll come in the dream telling you what to do. And uh, so it, it manifests into reality. And when I listen to his music, wow. The first time I cried, it was like so powerful. It's a kind of devotional music connecting him to her. And when you listen, sing with it, it does the same thing. It connects you to her, the goddess. The, this book is called The Goddess Amongst Us. And she is a goddess and a pretty amazing woman. So she's my latest, greatest connection. But through the years, I've connected with many different uh, saints, uh, masters and from India, from different countries, and all guiding me. It's guiding me to bring the wisdom to all of humanity. 
Sir Blake Sinclair is an author and a mystic philosopher, a grand knight commander of the Royal Equestrian Order of Michael Archangel. Back with more of our conversation in minutes. Stay with us. Hi there. If you want to watch the rest of these episodes, please head over to my Rumble channel, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. You can watch complete episodes there. New, complete, unedited episodes drop every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Again, the Rumble channel is Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. In the meantime, I want to thank you for supporting this YouTube channel all of these years. However, the problem is I never know when I'm going to run afoul of the censors at YouTube. I never know when I'm going to end up in YouTube jail. There doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason. And in fact, two more strikes and this YouTube channel will be taken down altogether. So help me fight big tech censorship. Enjoy the complete unedited episodes and join the rest of the Strange Planet community over on Rumble. Again, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet on Rumble.com. See you over there. are back with Sir Blake Sinclair. Um, you mentioned um, Claire Audience, getting the gift of Claire Audience at um, Mount Shasta. Um, but you had, as you, uh, from an early age, you had visions, um, mm -hmm. sort of prophetic visions of what, what our future was going to look like technologically and so forth. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, when I was very young, I think probably less than 10 years old, I just had a vision that in the future, cars would have sensors, you know, so kind of avoid them from bumping. And I had no idea. So, you know, the back then the cars are so simple, but I, I could see that in the future. So I just had a flashing vision. I said, okay. Now, now, flash forward, what, 30, 40 years later, cars have sensors. Hmm. And then I also had the visionary dream that I was, I guess, I teleported to the future. And that future, you know, vehicles so were levitated, you know, so they were flying with uh, so electromagnetic energy and uh, levitating. I was, it was like a public transportation. I was right, right below it. It just flew over me. It was an amazing feeling. So we have hope to see that in the, well, I don't know about this immediate future, but sometime in the future. Are you hopeful of our, about our future? Yeah, I, I'm hopeful. I, I think, uh, especially um, we just had this new lunar youth, new year of the, Wood Dragon, it's an auspicious year. It's a year of transformation. It's a year of manifestation. And I, I wrote my book there. The third book is a, a New Beginning. I wrote that title on purpose because I believe we are entering a new era, and especially with this crisis that happened, this health crisis. It triggered us to wake up. And I think with this year coming, it's, it's, it's making us, helping us to be more empowered. We just have to embrace the wisdom around us to realize that we can do much more through our actions, through our legal system, through our consciousness. People feel so helpless, but if you empower yourself to rise in consciousness from fear to joy, to love, to enlightenment, you can impact. One person can impact over millions of people a state of enlightenment consciousness. You reach heart of the love consciousness, probably 150 to 200,000 people based on this, uh, I think Dr. Hawkins, um, map of the human consciousness. So there's a lot we can do, you know, and there's a, I think um, we have to work together at multi-levels, you know, prayer helps, meditation helps, but we have to do much more than that, communicating from all levels, from the doctors to the, the lawyers, to the mystics, to the spiritual leaders and all that. So I'm hopeful and I see positive changes in the world. I know on your website, you write a lot about what happened during the pandemic. I talked, I've talked endlessly about it on this yeah. podcast and other programs. Um, is that what you mean by people are waking up that we now, many of us anyway, maybe not enough of us, but many of us realize that we were completely duped. Yes. Uh, yeah, that's right. and, and now, for example, in Canada, which I don't know if you're familiar with what went on here. Of course, you're probably familiar with the trucker protests and yes, so forth. That's right. 
uh, now the uh, one of the federal courts ruled that the government's uh, emergency, um, declaring an emergency, uh, um, or basically a state of emergency, that that was unconstitutional. Many of these trucker protests now are suing the government because they froze their bank accounts. Um, right, that's right. Do you see oh, that's more of this happening around the world? Do you see that uh, this whole lie is going to be exposed and come sort of tumbling down? Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, uh, I think even in Europe, I think there was uh, issues of farmers and the, the farmers are revolting uh, mm -hmm. against the, the, the demands put on them. People are realizing this is ridiculous and they have power. And I think what they did in the protest is having the people up there back down a little bit. We just have to realize there's more of us than them. And we have to realize that we work together and don't work in fear. We can make change, but we have to be consistent. And so that's one level. See, they're, they're doing a great job. But we also have the work at the consciousness level. There's a lot of energy going on the planet. There's a lot of dark energy. There's a whole battle of dark and light. And so we have to work on the level of frequency, consciousness, and also, you know, using public uh, so social media, everything to work together at it. It's not just one solution, but that's why I think uh, we, we need to work at this. This time is, uh, in space, we, we need to just collaborate and, and stop looking at religion as a difference. We have to look at things not to divide us, but what unites us. We're, we're you know, it doesn't matter where you're from, you're still a human being. And uh, if, we, if we work together, we can sustain our planet. We can evolve into more of a enlightened civilization it's not going to change overnight, but it's changing in that direction. So uh, a lot of people are very uh, dedicated to this process. People working behind the scenes, but things are getting better. We just have to uh, be believe in it and learn to tap into that divine presence within us. That I am teaching. I was talking about is the I am presence. You know, there's a there's a creator. There's a divine consciousness and anchors to us you know, through our heart which is a gateway to the universe. And we learn to tap into that and, and learn to turn away from all this deception, you know, through the media, social media, and, and trust our instinct, trust that divine presence guiding us in what to eat and what to do. And it will lead us towards a more enlightened civilization. We have to be wiser. We have to be more, more critical of our thinking. People were too complacent before and then listen to some authority figure, so-called authority figure, guy misguiding us and leading us to making bad choices. You know, there's a lot of people that compromise their health by listening to the popular recommendation. And people are told, stay home. You know, you stay away from the sunlight then your immune system goes down. You, you cover yourself up. You alter the microbiome of your mouth, predisposing yourself to gum disease and leading to heart problems later on because you alter that we were designed to breathe. And most of the studies, the real good studies, uh, legitimate studies, show that it doesn't really protect anything. You put it on, a lot of people put these little cotton mask on and they, you know everything goes through it. You sneeze, it goes through it. People do masks, three masks, and then they sneeze, it goes right through it. Psychological, it creates a kind of like a, like a little harness on you. It's like it become like a security blanket. Mm -hmm. But you know, I, I think we have to get back to the basic. You know, we have to, we've lost our connection to the, the divinity. You know, we, and the dollar bill used to say, in God we trust. Now it's like, we don't trust that anyway. We trust whatever's on the internet. And if the internet says it's, it's fake, it's gotta be fake. <laughs> and they don't realize that it's controlled by uh, puppeteers. You know, there's an Oz, there's a guy behind the curtain making all these decisions. And then we're just, then people just follow these rules but we're becoming like this world of artificial intelligence. They're not going to program those rules to us, you know, and, but we need to get away from the artificial intelligence and reclaim that divine intelligence. We're losing that, becoming zombies, so to speak, following technology and blindly. And they say, eat this, it's good. All this food that they're pushing you to eat, it, it, it seems like a good idea. And they say, well, don't eat meat, eat the vegetarian or they say, eat these bugs, you know, or something else, or they create these artificial food. You know, when they do that, and then the body reacts to it. And then of course we all get sick, we get cancer, we get all these different diseases and die sooner. So we have to tap back to the basic, get in contact to that, you know, meditate, find methods. My, my books teach you how to get to that point where you tap back into that divine presence. So 
if you read all my books, you realize that I met some of the greatest people on the planet just by listening to that. I met the prince that way. I met the Peter Mount Shasta, all these great masters. Uh, I have so many healers that I met and over 20, 25 of them willing to sit down with me to share the secret of how to live healthy and happy and long, with a long life, longevity. You know, because at the universe sees what's going on. And at the time I was writing my third book, uh, A New Beginning, I had no idea that this thing was coming, this crisis. But in retrospect, I think the universe was trying to give us the tools to help us strengthen our new system so we can navigate through this more gracefully and so that the fatality would be a lot, lot less, you know, or minimal. And uh, the book is, although it looks like a book of health, it's really a book about spirituality, if you really look at it and understand it, because we are complex human beings. We have a mental body, physical body, emotional body, spiritual body. Most people think you know, fitness, well, health is going to the gym, workout, eat some fruits and vegetables. That's just the beginning. If you're doing that, you're going to have an early expiration date. You know, you got to do more. Our air is contaminated. Our water is contaminated. Our, our food chain is contaminated. You know, we got pesticides sprayed over and over like berries, like 20 times. Our soil is depleted of the minerals. And so we, we corrupted through the industrialization process. We destroyed it because of greed, money. We want to make profit. And we won't tell you that these things hurt you until 20, 30 years later. Meanwhile, these these uh, people on top, these, these billionaires, trillionaires, they're, they're making money off of us, our sickness and our health. But it's up to us to take care of ourselves and reconnect to that, that the cosmic presence within us and rather than deny it, accept it, embrace it, and be empowered by it and, and learn how to tap into that divine cosmic consciousness and then amplify it to the rest of the world. So I do inner cleansing, I do fasting, I do social media fasting, intermittent fasting, and you know, and also planetary-wise, it's so toxic. I also work on planetary cleansing too. I mean, it sounds crazy. How do you but do that? How do you do that? How do you cleanse the planet? Well, I mean, it's not like a each person can do that. You just you meditate, you expand your consciousness, and you you you, you get a point where you're feeling oneness with the universe, cosmos, high frequency of love, love pureness, purity, and you expand that. So you expand it beyond your physical body to your home, to your city, to your state. As you visualize, you achieve, you manifest. And so the more people do that, the more cleansing happens. But to answer your question more specifically, I, I do a process of, uh, I invoke the violet flame. It's a very pure and uh, transforming light. light that transmutes the energy from lower vibrational energy to higher vibrational energy. So Peter Mount Shasta talks a lot about that. I use it a lot in my practice. Sometimes there's dark energy. You invoke the violet flame to purify it, to repel it. Sometimes you're having so much issues and addictions and you, 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 you call upon that light to purify your, your lower chakras, whatever chakra you need it. There's also a purple light, a violet purple light Every cell in the body and the whole universe is a violet light, according to Dr. Grandmaster Mantachia. So he says that areas that are filled with disease and illness doesn't have that light. So you visualize, because when you visualize, you, you, you're a creator, you create things within your body. I mean, we can create things. I mean, I'll give you an example. I have a friend, she is a healer, and uh, her Achilles tendon was really small, thin. And the doctor said, hey, you need surgery. But if we do surgery, it's going to probably have a problem later on. And as a young adult, she didn't like that. So she started to meditate, visualize these little guys fixing her Achilles tendons every day. I think 15, 20 minutes, a couple of times a day. After six weeks, it regenerated through her mind. It grew back. The doctor couldn't believe it. And so the power of the mind, I think people don't realize what we can do. And that's just from uh, your own self. But... If you can tap into the quantum realm through meditation practices, I mean, you visualize there's some merit to that. But if you learn how to do meditation, you can raise your vibrational energy and expand it. Then that's when you do the healing. So it's like a big tub of water. And it's, it's hot. Well, if you learn to meditate, you can amplify yourself to be, or let's say it's cold and you want to make it hot. You, your, your pure hotness, hot water, 
and you, you, you put a drop of it, and, and it, it alters a little bit. And the more people, it doesn't take the whole world to do that, it's impossible. But if you get enough people who really know how to meditate and visualize and, and use these techniques, you know, then you start changing. The water starts changing. It'd be warmer and warmer. It's going to be hot, but little by little time, it's going to alter it. And, you know, so violet flame is one thing I do. I, I do Reiki, so I use the different Reiki symbols, which activates uh, clearing as well, energy clearing. Because, you know, the, the planet and, and our body is just a temple, but inside core is energy and vibration. So you learn to tap into the quantum realm through energy techniques like Reiki. That helps. And I also use energy energy medicine techniques. It's a different symbols that they use, like the, the infinity symbol and the um, heart symbol. Mm -hmm. And I also elicit the support of the Ascended Masters, specifically. Uh, I, call, I call upon all of them. I, I remember, what was that Star Wars movie, The Last Jedi? Yes. And uh, uh, what was the name? What's the girl's name? Uh, the, well, the Last Jedi girl, and she was fighting this evil guy. And she says, I am all the Jedi's working together. And so that's why I do it. I kind of make a decree, pulling all the, the uh, Sunday Masters together and, and, and working through me to the planet, especially like Ananda Mayama. I, I chant her sacred mantra uh, and then visualize the planet evolving the dark energy, light energy from ego consciousness to unity consciousness, love consciousness, and God consciousness. And then you see that transformation of the planet from a darker energy to a lighter energy to green to pink and white. So the more of us do that, we shift that. See, but that's one level, you got one level. And you got all the lawyers doing their thing. Then you got people like you doing your thing. That's what it takes to wake up everybody. But we wake up and get empowered and then send that energy out. That, because if the other side is doing that. The dark side is doing that. I mean, they, they know it works. So they work with the moon. They work with the different uh, chants because it, it, it's powerful. They do, the, do that through the music industry, you know, to kind of control us. Well, that was my next question. Was the dark forces responsible for the pandemic? Um, they just found chemicals in the, in Cheerios that uh, make people infertile, and there's hormone blockers they're finding in Cheerios. Eighty percent of Americans are testing positive for these the presence of these chemicals. Yeah, it's, it's a very dark yeah. agenda. Are they? Yeah. Oh, they're aware uh, of this cosmic energy. Are they trying to uh, squash this cosmic energy through things like 5G and other? Is that what the is that why they're, you know, um, spraying chemtrails and 5G and and putting uh, you know sp spike proteins into our bodies and all of this? Is that to combat the cosmic energy? Well, yeah, I, in my, my opinion, I, I believe so. Ultimately, the the whole concept, the whole idea is. Tyranny, ultimate control. They want to make us onto like uh, lambs or sheep to follow orders, but the zombies basically and just follow it. And then uh, some somebody has an idea that this world is too overpopulated, so they're going to make measures to bring it to the size that they want. They basically want to get to the point where instead of letting the natural world do its thing, they want to control the world to be God, you know, the technological God, mm -hmm. and so that we become the extensions of uh, like a matrix. I mean, there's a severe matrix we're living in. So they're creating this artificial intelligence to help the tyranny. And then we're, they're creating a system that are, are sinking us to technology through the stuff that they're putting in our body. The chemtrails you're talking about, they, they have heavy metals that get into our body. The other things they recommend us put in our body, the juice, so to speak, you know, they, they create this metallic material and the more we do it, the more stable it becomes. That's why it's important to do it more and more. And at some point, that technology can sink into a computer. And, and so that information can, you know, like the SIM game, they can kind of control us, so to speak. So they can monitor us. They can influence us. So you have that. You become a, you're not organic anymore. You, you become uh, artificial intelligence. So you have artificial intelligence already in a computer, the whole internet. But I think ultimately they, they want us to be part of that system. The neural so link. The neural yeah, neural link. Yeah, yeah. Elon, Elon Musk talked about the one in our brain. But it's very dangerous. It sounds like a great idea at the time. But once they get these things into you and they're slowly getting into our body, they can basically eliminate you if, if you are not 
complying with their ideology. They can just turn the signal. I mean, this, this 5G is, is sounds like a great idea, but it's basically a giant microwave. You know, and you know, the exposure to you know 5G and EMF, it does there's a lot of health hazards. And most people don't even realize it. People have sleeping patterns that are, are disrupted, they have headaches. You know, in China, you, you need to, if you're pregnant, you have to wear something to protect yourself because otherwise they know there's a 5G will affect it. So you have to protect yourself. And there's clothing, there's a whole lot of stuff you can use to protect your house. And if you don't, you know, you're just going to expose your family to that harm, especially if you're pregnant. For God's sake, turn off your Wi-Fi at nighttime, turn it off, shield it, put something on it because you're, you're not being feared to the child that's inside the womb and exposing them to that. But you know, these things, I think, are set up for kind of uh, helping us with our technology, but they are, in the, you know, they are adjusted at the wrong frequency. Damage, massive damage can happen. And so I think originally it was part of a weapon, you know, that's from the military, and now they're using it in civilian use. But who's to say that, you know, whoever's in control decided that, hey, these guys are not listening. Turn up the frequency. And I think that's part of the problem in, in China. I think that's why so many people died because they have that rollout of the, of the 5G and then there's this pollution in the air. So people's lungs are already compromised. And people, we, we all have this virus in the body. We have a lot of virus in the body already. And then if you release this other virus on top of that, and if you up the frequency just a little bit, you're going to have massive damage because you, you basically let all the, the virus in your body out. And then that plus the introduction of the other one, plus your own immune system already compromised, massive damage. So it's, to me, a platform of tyranny. So you have this, I, I call it uh, the ego consciousness people, beings. You know, I think they're a small group, a very powerful group that's, you know, causing these things because they, they want to total tyranny, total absolute surrender of us. And they, they can't take everything away. You know, we, we have our divinity, our sovereignty, and we just, and, and our beliefs, and we're strong, and we can kind of change our future course of history. So right now, it's a, it's a, it's a very important time. What we do each day, what we say, what we, you know, how we think, now, where we are in our frequency and consciousness affects the future of where we're going to go. And uh, I see this tug of war, but I see it kind of going in a positive way. So I'm hopeful. And uh, I mean, we're not alone. See, the things we're not alone. We've got these you know, we have this divine consciousness. We, we have these ascended masters, these beings, they want to help us. And then we also have this whole realm of extraterrestrials. There's a dark side, there's, you know, I won't say dark and light, but like one's more ego consciousness, one that's more unity consciousness. Let's put it that way, you know, because that covers a lot. And then they, they exist. They're, they're trying to help us. They've been trying to tell us uh, to, you know, take care of our planet better. But, you know, corporate world takes over, they have profits over um, health and wellness. Sir Blake, we'll take another. Uh, we'll take okay. one more time out back with more of our conversation with Sir Blake Sinclair, Grand Knight Commander of the Royal Equestrian Order of Michael Archangel. Back with more in a moment. Hi there. If you want to watch the rest of these episodes, please head over to my Rumble channel, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. You can watch complete episodes there. New, complete unedited episodes drop every monday wednesday and friday again the rumble channel is richard Serrett's strange planet in the meantime i want to thank you for supporting this youtube channel all of these years however the problem is i never know when i'm going to run afoul of the censors at youtube i never know when i'm going to end up in youtube jail there doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason and in fact two more strikes and this youtube channel will be taken down altogether so Help me fight big tech censorship, enjoy the complete unedited episodes, and join the rest of the Strange Planet community over on Rumble. Again, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet on Rumble.com. See you over there.
Sir Blake Sinclair stays with us. The three uh, books in the trilogy, Dare to Imagine, Beyond Imagination, and the uh, new one is A New Beginning, An Antidote to Civilization. Um, where do you see uh, ET disclosure in all of this? Um, do you do you have visions about that? Do you, is it forthcoming? I mean, we have had a number of high-profile whistleblowers testify before Congress. I mean, it really seems to be ramping up, and yet, not surprisingly, perhaps the the legacy media doesn't seem very interested in covering these. I mean, we're talking about whistleblowers who are talking about back engineering UFOs and government programs and alien bodies being discovered and and so forth, and and it's just complete silence from the media. Well, I think the the media is talking more about UFOs lately, and I think that you're going to hear more about it because, like like everything else, it's going to be used as a platform to uh, control humanity more. So I, I think that that's that's in the works. They use healthcare to hijack humanity. So I think the next step is the next step of uh, uh, using extraterrestrial. As, as, a, as a platform to unite humanity, humanity against this threat, creating them into like this ultimate evil. So then we have to protect ourselves, come together. So I, I see that um, you're gonna hear more and more in the media about extraterrestrial in a negative sense. Now, the reality is that if they wanted to wipe us out, they would have wiped us out a long, long time ago. We're still here. And uh, it, you know, there's this whole light side and dark side or, ego consciousness and unity conscious, you know, out there in this whole angelic realm. But I, I think that's what they're going to do. They, they have technology. They can create visions of these extraterrestrials. They, they have vehicles already made. I mean, some of the UFOs you see, they're not really UFOs. They're actually uh, something that the government retrieved and rebuilt through reverse engineering. The real ones, like the one I showed you, the one, the, the video I showed you, it zigzags and it's very erratic and it zips away so fast. But I think in the future, you're going to start seeing uh, more, hearing about more sightings, bigger sightings, and even possibly some devastating ones, showing that they're a threat. And that's why I see. So it's not going to be that they're hiding it. They're going to disclose it more and more until we all believe that they're a threat to us. They're using it to manipulate us again. Another campaign to create this uh, fear in, in, the, in, the, in the humanity. I hope that doesn't happen, but that's what I feel that's going to be happening uh, next, because they have to find ways to, to kind of c control us more and more. Uh, you sent a couple of, well, you sent a, me a number of images, and I just want to go through these, and I'll insert these into the uh, Rumble and YouTube versions of this uh, podcast. Um, the first two um, look to be uh, from maybe your Instagram, and it's kind of a and some sort of an entity. It looks almost like a small child standing in front of a door. It's black and white. We see the legs oh, and sort of the upper torso, but we don't see anything else. What is that? Yeah, that's an interesting picture. Um, my friend sent me that, and she lives in Minnesota, and she lives like in a farm in a rural area, and she just caught that, and we don't know what it is. It's uh, weird because there's nobody out there, and all of a sudden you, you capture this like a childlike uh, being. So I thought that was kind of weird that you might want to check it out. Maybe someone knows what it is. But I, I share that because in her area, it seems like it's a favorite the place for UFOs to fly through. She sees UFOs all the time. And in fact, I was thinking, I said, maybe I'll travel to your place one day and uh, spend a couple of days here to witness some of these UFOs flying by. But uh, yeah, just to show that the reality is that these beings, they exist. You know, It could be a child, it could be a demon, it could be an entity of some sort, so it could be an orb, there's all types. I, I've, I've seen a, a ghost uh, when I was uh, working back in 1987 in a rehab facility, and it was just like a regular person. He walked by, he waved his hand, I waved my hand, and I told her, so I was like, oh, this guy came by. He goes, oh, did you know he passed away last week? I said, I'm no kidding. I, I just saw him. He's just right there in front of me. And the interesting thing is that not only me, he appeared to other people, so it's kind of validation of what I saw. But throughout my life, I've seen different things, but nothing like so 3D, like a real person. Usually you see a shadow or you feel the energy, um, but nothing like that. That was the first time I see something in 3D form. If we're living in a simulation, what are these? I mean, does the simulation help to explain 
what we're seeing. Are these the spirits of um, people who have died or is there something else going on? Are we tapping into, I don't know, a, a parallel universe or another dimension? What's going on? No, no, I, I think in that particular case, uh, I think the man, he passed away. He was doing his final visit with his wife who was living in that facility. So he came by, made his presence known to some of the people that maybe he liked, and then that, that was it. I never saw him again. There are situations, I think, that uh, things happen to people. They die, and they leave, but the energy is still there. So you, you see this kind of uh, repeat cycle. Maybe they're doing the same thing over and over uh, because that energy is so strong. So that that can happen too. And then you have poltergeists, and you have all, all types of... Then you have haunted house where people... They stay there and they don't want to leave. And uh, I have clients like that. I mean, I, I see clients some many times at their home, homes, and uh, probably between one and five percent have something paranormal going on. And a few of them, they they send me uh, videos of it. I had one lady was not doing well, and I was wondering. I said, you know, why isn't she doing well? Because if she does what I tell her to do, she should be getting well. And she has this kind of crazy look in her eye. I said, that doesn't look right. I said, I think there's something like a entity or something in, in the family. They sent me the video and then you can see in her room, I think I, I sent you that video, a big flash and then you see insects and then all of a sudden you see all these orbs flying all, are all around her. So orbs can be negative and they can be uh, angelic orbs too. I sent you a video of myself doing some kind of a spiritual ceremony and you see like so many, so many orbs flying around yes. us. My, yes. my friend's a healer she always has these orbs following her, but then when we got together, you know, the spiritual energy just drew all these these kind of angelic orbs around us. And my friend, who's a, a, a great healer, she has them flying around her as well. Uh, there's one more photo I want to talk about, and it it looks like a, a glass bowl, and it's it's got what appears to be red sand, maybe, and then on top of it, uh, a bunch of white pebbles they almost look like quartz oh um let me see let me show you oh is this thing here like this yes okay so this one is uh very mystical they are actually the relics of buddha gautama buddha given to me by a buddhist master from thailand i i refer to her in my book as master relica and this, so long time ago, she was living in Thailand and she was a, a lawyer at the time or studying to be a lawyer at the time. And she was given these uh, relics from a Thai Buddhist master and she didn't know anything about it. She took it, brought it home, but she's a very devout Buddhist and she meditated. And one day she saw these orbs of light go into the container and the container is like this, it's sealed. And I think there were like seven uh, relics. And then all of a sudden it multiplied to like hundreds and thousands of them. And then, so she would give them away to like Buddhist temples, Buddhist masters, and they, they would multiply again. So that master that gave it to her, eventually he passed away and they, they cremated his body. And then usually Buddhist masters, they, they're a really high level. They leave behind relics like Buddha. He had, a, he had a crystal, he had a relic. And so she would all, later on connect with him like an ascended being, he would communicate to her and tell her like, okay, the next day you're going to get some relics, not of Buddha, but of this different Buddhist master in Thailand. So this kind of phenomenon happens a lot in Thailand. A lot of the Buddhist masters there can manifest it. So she would manifest it. So she would put like a tray, an offering to Buddha. And then all of a sudden these things would materialize from, from the ethers, from nowhere. And, and these are small ones. The one I showed you was a size of a, a small than a grain of rice. But like this one, here's one here, that's a bigger one. Can you see it here? Yes. Yeah, so that's a bigger one. And some are even bigger than that. Some have uh, crystal colors of different Buddhist masters that are very close to Buddha. And she has a whole, like thousands and thousands of these things. And they are conscious. They know what's going on. There was a, a friend of hers that she gave it to, and she was living a very indulgent life. And uh, it left her. This dematerialized and she became sad and she prayed and said i'm so sorry i'll, I'll change my life i'll change my pattern and and it, it came back so there's a consciousness so this is a proof that you know there is life after death and these things are sacred they contain pure consciousness 
and they can materialize. That's how she can get these things because they materialize to her. And it's uh, but she's very private. That's why we just gave her kind of a, a code name of uh, Master Melika, a pretty extraordinary master. And she's in my book, the third book. A New Beginning, An Antidote to Civilization, and uh, the other two, Dare to Imagine, 18 Principles for Finding Peace, Happiness, and True Success, and Beyond Imagination, A Path to God and the Divine Realm, and of course, again, A New Beginning, An Antidote to Civilization. Uh, where do we get these books? The easiest place is by Amazon. Amazon has everything. If you're in the Pleasanton area, the Valley Health Mill store has that. Um, there's some stores in the San Francisco that has it. The, the under, underground store has it. Um, they had it in the Enlightenment store in San Francisco for a long time, but Amazon's the easiest way. All right. Sir Blake, a great pleasure to meet you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. It's a pleasure. Hi there. If you want to watch the rest of these episodes, please head over to my Rumble channel, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. You can watch complete episodes there. New, complete unedited episodes drop every monday wednesday and friday again the rumble channel is richard Serrett's strange planet in the meantime i want to thank you for supporting this youtube channel all of these years however the problem is i never know when i'm going to run afoul of the censors at youtube i never know when i'm going to end up in youtube jail there doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason and in fact two more strikes and this youtube channel will be taken down altogether so Help me fight big tech censorship, enjoy the complete unedited episodes, and join the rest of the Strange Planet community over on Rumble. Again, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet on Rumble.com. See you over there. Hello and welcome once again to another episode of Strange Planet. And if you'd like to get a little deeper into Strange Planet, just click on the link in the episode notes, strangeplanet.supportingcast.fm, strangeplanet.supportingcast.fm. You gain access to commercial free listening, special bonus episodes that are produced exclusively for premium subscribers, and you also receive a free subscription to my monthly newsletter, Inner Sanctum, strangeplanet.supportingcast.fm. As was graphically described in the first Genesis 6 conspiracy book, there are giants among us passing largely unnoticed intent on carrying out a secret plan to enslave all humanity. They may not look like giants today, but their bloodlines and DNA extend all the way back to the Nephilim the offspring of angels who mated with human women, described in Genesis 6, when giants were roaming the land. Now, in this new book, The Genesis 6 Conspiracy Part 2, author Gary Wayne goes in-depth with new information and explanations for each premise laid out in the first book. Gary is the author of The Genesis 6 Conspiracy, How Secret Societies and the Descendants of Giants Plan to Enslave Mankind, and the Genesis 6 Conspiracy Part 2, how understanding prehistory and giants helps define end-time prophecy, which details the role of modern-day Nephilim and Satan's plan to install the Antichrist at the end of days. Gary is a Christian contrarian who has maintained a lifelong love affair with biblical prophecy, history, and mythology. His extensive study has encompassed the Holy Bible and Gnostic scriptures, the Quran, and the Bhagavad Gita, Gilgamesh and other ancient epics, language, etymology, and secret society publications. Gary Wayne, welcome back to Strange Planet. How are you? Doing very well, and uh, thank you for inviting me to your show, and happy to be working with you again, and looking forward to the conversation. Um, you stated that uh, after the Genesis 6 conspiracy, you weren't going to write uh, a part two, uh, but then you did. Oh, why? Yeah, it's a good question. So I thought 
I didn't want to do a sequel because I didn't want to be redundant. And I have other topics and books that I'd like to uh, to write about. And I actually started writing another book uh, as this one was still playing out in the marketplace. And I was having trouble sort of getting my mind around that book and um, making it work. And in the meantime, with all of the social media that I do, all the interviews, all the shows I take questions on, emails, I learned that Christians had a certain angst that was out there uh, and that they liked book one because it's completely unique uh, on the market and it ties in sort of a global perspective and then how it matches up with uh, what it, what it says in the Bible. But what they were looking for was something that would go deeper into uh, the Bible. They wanted to know more about prehistory. They wanted to know more about giants. They wanted to know more about hybrid giants if they were there. They wanted to know about the gods and the fallen angels and what kind of hierarchy and how that all connects into end time prophecy. And they wanted to know more about the conquest with the giants and the giant wars. So I finally took a step back and listened to my audience and decided maybe I could do a book that wasn't going to be redundant. And so that was the genesis for book two. And it's a book specifically targeted at Christians so that they can take passages and excerpts right out of the book for arguments and pushback that they would get from with, with inside the church. And it is totally unique in the same way as the first book is, but completely sort of different in terms of the style and the approach. And so even for people who aren't Christians, this book talks more about giants and more about the kinds of giant nations that were there and the impact that it had on post-Diluvian history than any other book that's out there. So this is uh, new territory in the kinds of information that's there. And what I'm doing is I'm highlighting important context of prehistory uh, that you're going to need to understand end time prophecy. And then the last two sections of the book, I'll actually lay down a chronology for end time prophecy that hopefully will start to connect some dots for people. And I have a different approach than most eschatolog eschatological approaches. And I put that premise in the preface of book two. And it's really designed to make it simple and to take all the conflicts away. All right. So let's just give people a very quick uh, crash course of, of Genesis 6 uh, and and what it says. And then we can uh, talk about, I guess, some of the, the sort of the scriptural scriptural and uh, um, I don't know, evidence in in uh, in the text that that we're actually talking about. Uh, giants and then hybrids, human alien hybrids. So let's talk about what Genesis six actually says. Yeah, it's uh, Genesis six is the beginning of the flood story, and Genesis six one through four is the passage that introduces something for Christians. And for me, when I started to uh, get back into Christianity and re you know looking at the Bible and studying it closely, it created a bit of you know, mental um, cognizant dissonance in my mind when I'm there for prophecy and I'm coming across this passage that is talking about sons of God, fallen angels that are procreating with human females to create giants. And it's the context and the preamble for the flood story. And I'm going, I don't want anything to do with that when I first read it. And I get it. And Genesis 6, 1 through 4, is probably one of the most, if not the most controversial passage sort of within Christianity with one, with mo most of mainstream Christianity saying it doesn't say what you're reading. And the other part that is saying, well, it does. And there's so many other passages that relate to it, that verify its veracity and that it is something that if most Christians were, you know, if they bring it up in their churches, they're actually asked to leave or not to ask the question again. Wow. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Um, they don't want to touch it. So the idea that um, these fallen angels 
took as wives, either through coercion, force, uh, through some sort of negotiation, took the the daughters of men, uh, who then conceived um, these offspring that became known as the Nephilim, that they were in fact giants. This is disputed by many. Um, are we actually talking, uh, or or where is the the scriptural evidence, or outside of the Bible, even uh, if we're talking about ancient Hebrew, or evidence that that what we're really talking about here are giants? Yeah. So, if you're reading a modern translation Bible, it will say Nephilim in Genesis six four, and if you're reading the King James Version Bible, it will say giant, and giant goes back to a Hebrew word nephil. And the I am is the male plural, and it's defined in the what I call the concordance that is the definitions to the words of Hebrew that's translated into English from the original Masoretic text for the King James Version, for example. That word is defined as a tyrant, as a bully, a giant, and giants, as in giant tribes. And so a lot of people will say, well, you have to be careful in terms of how you translate that. And that's absolutely true uh, because Hebrew and Greek has multiple meanings. So you have to select the right passage for the verse and that it fits within the passage, the chapter, and there aren't any other conflicts in scripture. So if you look at the word tyrant, that goes back to tyrannos which was the word that evolved back through, and I cover this off in book two, uh, of the Gyges kings, which were Tyrannos. And these were the Gyges kings that were descendants of giants in a dynastic order. And one specific line that came from uh, the Herculides or Hercules, son of Zeus, as a specific sort of patriarch. And so Tyrannos uh, and Gyges is part of the meaning. So it's a they were tyrant kings, as we sort of understand that. And that Gyges, or uh, Gyes in the plural, is the source word for Greek and giant. So you have Gigantes, a lot of people sort of look back. And that's also rooted in Gyges with the G-I-G-A-S transliterated into English. And E-S turns that G to a Y. So Gyges singular, Gyes plural, gigantic singular, Gigantes as they're known in other giant creatures in Greek mythologies in the plural and an order of giants that were created. So it's associated from those two words or the Tyrannos and um and Gyges uh in throughout history and the and in polytheist uh history and also there's another word in there that's a bull or a bully because bully derives from bull mm. and in the Ugaritic text for the Raphaim which are the post diluvian giants that Baal and Ashtaroth created uh not only were the gods like Baal Ashtaroth and the parent god El called bulls but so were their spurious offspring, were dynastic kings, giants. And so the Canaanite pantheon is the pantheon that's talked most about in the Bible. So we can take that as a direct parallel, and the Ugaritic text runs very, very close with its analogy of the Baalim gods from the Council of Gods on Mount Hermon and the creation of the giants and how that overlaps into RPM, which is a Semitic word for Raphaim, for Hebrew, which are the post diluvian giants. So any way you look at that word, it means giant. And then Raphaim also means giant and also has extension words that are spirit, uh, evil demon, uh, and also healing is the root word. All parts of the meaning of Raphaim because they were thought to have healing powers or self-healing powers, just like the Merovingian kings or the Fisher King concept in polytheism had that healing sort of quality to it. And it's one of the reasons why you have to take the head of a giant is because that healing quality. So the demon aspect is the disembodied spirit of a giant once it's been killed. And then, of course, uh, the giant, as it's described as a giant, means exactly that. So how do we know these giants were large? So let's make do a couple of accounts on that. So in the Bible, we get 
uh, Goliath, which I think everybody might be familiar with, and he's listed at six cubits and a span. And he was the king of Gath, one of five kings at the time of the duel between David. And David takes five smooth stones because he thinks he might have to kill five giant kings that day. Uh, and not that he's going to miss. So once he fells Goliath, he chops his head off as part of the whole sort of connections. And so six cubits in as a royal cubit at 21 inches and a span of six inches would make him uh, 11 feet, three inches tall. Wow. And even if it was a standard cubit, he would be about nine feet tall. Um, so not, I mean, giant like, but that wouldn't be giant. But as a king, and Josephus says to measure these giants on a royal cubit because they are a royale. And so the bed that Og had was nine cubits long, four cubits wide. He's the last of the Raphaim. You'll see that word giant used a lot in the Old Testament. It goes back to Rapha, except for three times when it's Nephilim. Uh, so, and one time to Gibberim, which is also connected in the book of Joshua. So this bed was made of metal because it wouldn't carry his weight. He was the king of Edrai and Ashtaroth of Mount Hermon. And Ashtaroth is the, is the mother goddess of the Raphaim. And so again, you see the connections that are starting, you, you, how you can link the Ugaritic text with the biblically and get... Uh, similar related stories. And so Og is, his bed would be close to 16 feet tall, seven feet wide, made of iron. So that would make him somewhere between 12 and 15 feet high and say four to six feet wide, somewhere in that zone. So that two to one dimension that is classified within the dimensions of nine and four cubits is the sort of the understanding of stout in the Old Testament in terms of the KGV, which is describing these giants. So they were, they had a two to one height to width ratio for the most part versus a three to one for humans. And so they were very muscularly wide and large. And so I would put them at somewhere, you know, as I say, somewhere 12 to 14 feet tall and say four to five and a half feet wide. Outside the Bible, we get giants like Orontes or Achilles, and you could go through a number of them. They range 12 to 13 feet tall. So again, in that range where Og is, but then we get one that's in the Ugaritic text, that's in the Sumerian text, like the Epic of Gilgamesh and many others, and it has a constant dimension for Gilgamesh, son of Lugalbanda, sixth generation after the flood, so son of Lugabanda and the mother god is Nin, and he is 11 cubits tall and seven cubits wide. So he, or uh, four cubits wide. So he's seven feet wide and 19 feet tall as a royal cubit. And that is the largest one that I have for a sort of a size after the flood. And he's a dark haired giant. So he's a different kind of post-Diluvian giant than the red haired, blonde haired uh, hazel-eyed, hazel -eyed, blue-eyed giants that are discussed in the land of the covenant or the Holy Land uh, and in the Bible. So there's a couple of different kinds. And what's also important to keep in mind is, is that the giants before the flood were larger. Ah, okay. So let's talk about the post-Diluvian uh, giants or the second incursion. And in Genesis 6, it talks about there were giants on the land in those days and after, meaning after the flood. Um, is, are there any clues in Scripture as to how this second incursion took place if we were to understand that the first apocalypse or the flood uh, was basically to clean the, uh, the gene pool, as it were, and wipe out uh, the giants? How did the second incursion take place? Yeah, so there's really only two ways you see giants after the flood is one is somehow they survive the flood and there's a few different theories out there and i'm open to those i lean more to a second incursion because it fits better um but we don't get that super smoking gun verse like genesis 6 1 through 4 after the flood although it's certainly when you look at the hebrew text that when it's talking about that the sons of god came again we just don't know 
to the extent of that, obviously more before the flood, but also probably again after the flood. And so there seems to be a few more restrictions and things that are going on in terms of the giants. They're not as big. They don't live as long, things like that. They have powers, but not seemingly the same kinds of power. So biblically, when we look at um, how these giants show up, we have to sort of look at passages that would describe a scenario where that might happen. So when we look at uh, Jude 1, 6 and uh uh, 2 Peter 2, you have passages that are connecting the sins of the fallen angels with Sodom and Gomorrah. And so what's interesting about that is out from outside biblical texts is, is you have the Gnostics who have an account about the creation of giants that were created at Gomorrah before the flood and then Sodom replanted after the flood. Mm. And so now when you look at this filthy conversation, as the King James uh, Bible describes it, that's going on between Lot and the people of Sodom, is that uh, they're wanting these angels that they recognize as angels to come out and have sex with them. And these are equated with the same types of crimes as before the flood. So we typically sort of understand that as homosexuality from a biblical perspective. Uh, and that would be part of the crimes as the book of uh, Lamech of Cain and other sources outside the Bible say was a common trait of the giants before the flood and by inference after the flood. And perhaps the crime, when you look at what Ham did to Noah after the flood and the curse of Ham that falls on Canaan, who are the Canaanites who are going to live amongst the giants to try and get rid of that curse, all things they cover off uh, in, in book two, uh, you could interpret that as either a sexual attack on Noah's wife biblically or on Noah, but more likely Noah because he's the one who's addressed. And when those laws, and this is sort of long on the minutiae of it, when they're talking about uh, uncovering somebody, the person is named. And even though it will be an uncovering of the spouse as well, the crime usually is attributed to the one that's named, and it's no other that is is named. And so he's the one who realizes what has happened when he wakes up from his drunken uh, stupor. And, you know, that's when he issues this prophetic curse on Ham. But it doesn't take place with Ham. It's going to take place with Canaan. And so this is a common trait amongst the, the giants, both before and after the flood. And probably even more so after the flood because of a fertility issue that uh, is part of the Raphaim and why they're going to need to intermarry with humans. It's kind of a different sort of rabbit hole here. So when we look at um, the second incursion then and bringing the sort of full circle and back to the Sodom narrative, my point is, is that this is Sodom, Gomorrah, and the cities of the plain were the cities of the giants from bef before the flood and also after the flood and they're ruled over by giant Raphaim kings and this is a city in pentapolis that worships the canaanite pantheon of baal and ashtaroth offspring gods ruling after the flood el would have been the one before the flood as a parent god and that they had created these giants and so they were very familiar with this concept and that the angels could take a form and a gender of their choice. So the question gets to be in that passage with this filthy conversation and the crimes being the same as angels, were they wanting to have the angels to have sex with uh, females from that city? Or did they want them to change gender and to have sex with the men to create giants? Because just as in the Ugaritic text, they're doing fertility issues for Baal and Ashroth to come back. And they're in the pit prison by this point for the same crimes as the parent gods did after the flood to reproduce giants because they have that fertility issue and it may be a little bit of both going on there so you have all of this sort of knowledge and information about the giants that are located in that area whom the canaanites intermarried with 
and the Rephaim were the kings, and that they were worshiping these gods who created the giants, that that knowledge would be well known and well understood. And yet they wanted to have sex with these angels. So it's a matter of the format, and it might be all of the above, or it might be specifically to create the new giants, but it's equated, and that's the key. And so in the days of Noah is when the giants were created and that reference is a constant for those as a defining scriptural annotation for the crimes of the angels before the flood and then after the flood. Uh, so just to clarify, to clarify the antediluvian um, giants or the fallen angels responsible for the Nephilim, were they cherubim, seraphim? Do we know? Yeah, that's a good question. So what we do know is there's a couple different kinds, as we mentioned, uh, both before and after the flood, and that um, the watchers that were doing most of the sexual violations were likely the seraphim, which are serpent-faced, uh, six-winged dragon angels and creator gods. And so that's why you have pantheons around the world dominated by the seraphim look uh, in terms of the serpentine or dragon look and the early depictions of giants after the first you know beginning right after the flood and before the flood were they were described as serpents so when seraphim take a physical form which they can as as noted in the sodom story we know angels can take a physical form and also hebrews 13 where you're told to be kind to strangers lest you run across an angel and there's other passages but just to give um, the listeners out there an understanding that they have the ability to take a physical form in an oiketarian as it's called and i explain that term in book two in terms of how that works as a dwelling place for the spirit that uh <clears throat> that these fallen angels um have the ability to not only do this, but to pass on the DNA that is in that body that they create and attributes through that DNA that provides the extra gifts of so size, healing powers, whatever else would be a part of it. And a lot of people look at a hive mind or telepathic capability as, as a key part of that uh, as well. And so we also get an example of cherubim that are worshipped around the world and they have four different faces they have a face of a lion they have a face of a bird or an eagle some people say owl and raven uh, they have a, a, a face of a bull or an ox bull is probably a better translation for that and a face of a human so we see these sphinxes these cherubs that depict all of these faces but one at a time that were worshipped and they guarded temples, they guarded the uh, palaces and they guarded the gateways and the portals to Sheol or Hades where those gods uh, home was located at and let Baal would go back and forth every day between uh, to oversee his, his empire as the chief god of the pantheon. And so we also have depictions in Sumeria on reliefs of these bird-faced Anunnaki. Mm. These are cherubim. We also have pictures of these Anunnaki with these wings and they're stocky wide. So that's where some of that sort of stoutness, because you see these huge legs, right? <laughs> and one of the reasons why they were called bulls is because of that strength. And that you see this identical relief with a human face on other depictions. And so that's a different face of a cherubim doing the same thing. So they would take by implication or inference a single face when they appeared on earth. So whatever form they took, if they reproduced, they would reproduce giants. So I think this is where the cherubim uh, dark haired offspring comes from that are larger than the seraphim ones as Gilgamesh is equated with and Nimrod is conflated with, uh, that we see coming out of Mesopotamia or out of the Syrian area. Uh, and they're very, very much similar to the Mesopotamian ones. And the dark-haired Greek giants are would be part of that same classification. But we also get stories about, biblically, the lion men of Moab 
and, and the lion-like gadites. And these are descriptions of lions, and it goes back to Airy and Ariel, as you would take, take that back in the words. And Ariel is, in the occult, a specific angel. And Airy is the source for Arian, and the post-Diluvian giants and many of the anti-Diluvian giants were Indo-Aryans. There were the four or five groups that show up as aboriginals after the flood, whom the people from Babel, a hundred years afterwards, will migrate to and intermarry with. And so we have one king in the War of Giants in Genesis 14, where the tribe of Raphaim shows up of giants in a war of giants. And then these Raphaim in Genesis 15 as well, in the land God is promising Abraham amongst the mighty seven and the mighty 10. And the extra three there are of the Cadmonites, the uh, Kenizzites and the Kenites are all giants. And I cover that off in this book. So that's the mighty 10 that are being described there of giants and hybrid giants. Uh, and so these Raphaim in the war of giants, uh, in Genesis 14, they're fighting against four kings of Mesopotamia that are also kings. The greatest war after the flood and for hundreds, maybe thousands of years afterwards with the size of the army and the size of the beings. And one king is named Arioch, and that means lion-like. So if you're going to have lion gods, are there lion gods biblically that are listed? And are there lion gods in polytheist pantheons and the answer is yes so you would have nergal which is a war god of sumeria who is depicted as a lion god and worshiped amongst the eastern avim in the bible <laughs> and so you have like mahis uh in uh and bast in the egyptian and a few other gods that were lion-like in the egyptian pantheon and so if they produced offspring in that lion-like form they would produce these kinds of, of giants and then you have a another god that's worshipped by the uh, this is a little off track but uh, in in that area where the avim are nibaz that means a barking god hmm. so a dog god just like anubis is a jackal god who produced right. giants in polytheism and created so many of these giant warrior dog uh, Nephilim that they created a city that the Greeks called Sino, uh, Sinoopolis, which is you know, dog city by its definition. Sinocephalies is the term for the dogmen uh, mythos, right? And so you have these, these angels that seemingly have the ability to pass on those looks onto their spurious offspring. And then you have the bird one, or as in the Anunnaki relief that we have. And you have uh, these Tengu giants uh, in Southeast Asia, uh, warriors and uh, priests. And you can, you can Google it, T-E-N-G-U, and you get this bird-faced warrior and gods and demigods that were the offspring of Tengu gods, of uh, watcher gods. And you also have the Zibalba in the Popol Vuh, which is an owl-faced demigod, and the house of Kamazots, which means the house of bat. And if you Google Kamazots, you get Batman's outfit that comes up. <laughs> <laughs> and so lots of evidence out there about passing on those traits. And so you have different kinds of giants that uh, tend to go back to the warrior like Cherubim, who were the guard guardian type of angels on earth in the physical world and were the covering angels with their wings in the angelic realm and were also used with flaming swords to guard the gates of Eden after Adam and Eve were ostracized. So lots of things point to two watcher angels creating these other creatures. And then with the idea of Anubis and, and Nebaz creating other kinds of uh, Nephilim as in dog Nephilim, one wonders about how many different ranks and orders of angels there were and did they procreate? Well, we don't know whether they all procreated, but certainly the jackal ones did by the historical references. And I have a great three document uh, series on dog men and gods. If people want to get a hold of me through my website, I'll send that to you at no charge. 
Gary, we'll take a quick time out. It seems the whole world was teeming <laughs> with giants even after the flood. We'll uh, take a time out, come back. More of my conversation with Gary Wayne. The book is The Genesis 6 Conspiracy, Part 2. Stay with us. Hi there. If you want to watch the rest of these episodes, please head over to my Rumble channel, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. You can watch complete episodes there. New, complete, unedited episodes drop every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Again, the Rumble channel is Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. In the meantime, I want to thank you for supporting this YouTube channel all of these years. However, the problem is I never know when I'm going to run afoul of the censors at YouTube. I never know when I'm going to end up in YouTube jail. There doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason. And in fact, two more strikes and this YouTube channel will be taken down altogether. So help me fight big tech censorship. Enjoy the complete unedited episodes and join the rest of the Strange Planet community over on Rumble. Again, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet on Rumble.com. See you over there. Gary Wayne is with us, the author of The Genesis 6 Conspiracy and the brand new one, Genesis 6 Conspiracy Part 2. Um, the Rephaim, um, when David slew uh, Goliath, was Goliath not the last of his kind? Was, was, that not, was that not the end of the Rephaim? No, it wasn't. Uh, and, and most people think that, you know, the Bibles aren't, giants aren't, mentioned after that account but even in david's lifetime his wars wiped out many giants and most of the wars were against the philistines but they also did wars against the amalekites who had giants and hybrid giants as well and these wars continued throughout the time of king solomon with the hadad dynasties which is the baal equivalent word for uh, the god and named after as, as a dynastic bloodline of that spurious offspring. And these are the Edomite, Horim, and Amalekim bloodlines that Solomon was fighting against. And so when we talk about giants being dynastic, these are the royals. These are the descendants that we see today where King Charles III did that ancient rite of inheritance that King Hadad or King Agog, or any of these polytheist kings did the same rituals of their ritual right of inheritance with the divine right to rule uh, given to them by their patriarchal uh, celestial mafia godfather, fallen angels, I say that kind of tongue in cheek as an initiatory organization as well, and that uh, that comes from the council of the gods on mount hermon it's known by other names around the world and there could be seven mountains but biblically mount hermon or mount saffon as it's called in the ugaritic text the bible also calls it syrian and sion as well um so there's many different names nippur would be the name in um sumeria and so they take their genealogies back to the specific patriarchs of giants and to a specific God that they swear their oaths to, just as you have the oath of Harem Anathema introduced with the 200 watchers on Mount Hermon, according to the book of Enoch. And I cover this off on how those words all have Hebrew roots to it and have the same sort of meanings. And that's the start of that oath-based system, both before the flood, that again restarts after the flood, complete with their polytheist mystical religion, that's all part of that hierarchy. So these are the royals that come down through history. And they've been ruling the world in the top two classes ever since, leaving a small entrepreneurial class of bakers and tailors. And then there's the slave and working class. So 
whether or not it's the educated class, only the elite or the royals, the larger nobility were educated. The priest class was dominated by the families, just as you have the black nobility in the Roman church that dominated the popes uh, for leadership there. Uh, and that's part of the larger rex deus or royal, as I talk about as well, royal meaning king. And al is a translation of el, for a god or an angel just as baal means lord god right so these these are the dynastic kings that that ruled from the beginning and continue to rule and they dominate the governments the kingships the thrones everything at the elite class and write all of the history um given that there was so much you know intermarriage what what percentage of humans uh are not um a part fallen angel yeah it's, it's a it's a really good question so uh, and that they had to intermarry with humans after the flood it was a necessity uh for them just as the ugaritic texts are wanting uh the rephaim are wanting baal and Ashtaroth to come back to create more so that word Ugarit is the Hebrew word erit, and uh, Ug, I take this back in the book, is actually Og. So this originally was the city of Og, the terrible one. Erit means terrible, and one, one is the I am plural, so it's not on the city. It's just Kiriath Ugarit uh, is how it would be in the original Hebrew. And in that definition of these terrible ones, and these terrible ones for people who want to check this reference, comes out of Ezekiel 32, goes back to the Hebrew word erit, and these are the slain Raphaim kings talking from the pit prisons and the sides of the abyss, along with the mighty, the angels that are in their L, um, as that goes back to Hebrew, to Pharaoh, a Raphaim bloodline king, another beast king, in this really uh, preternatural dual prophecy, as I like to call it, for the time of uh, Pharaoh and the time of the end time and gives you some unique prehistory information is my definition of a, of, of a dual prophecy. And in that definition, it has all sorts of descriptions to s describe these terrible ones, but also two that, me, that say childless and fertility issues. And so that wasn't from ovum or sperm. That was, they had an inability to produce enough women. And then they had a bad habit of killing the rivals' wives as well. Those are the rivals, because they, there's complete rivalries all the way throughout uh, the history of the giants, because they want to be the only ruling dynastic family. And it was like that before the flood. It was started again after the flood continued right through World War I. And we're seeing it start to play out again on the world stage today, I think. So these are the ones that had to intermarry with humans lest they go extinct. That's whom the Canaanites intermarried with. And so you get in the Canaanite table of nations or in the table of nations, the Canaanites are listed three patriarchs, Canaan, Heth, and Sidon. And then you get nine patriarchless Canaanites. That's because Raphaim aren't listed in the table of nations. And so we know Rapha for the Raphaim is not listed. And the Anakim, that's talked about as giants in Numbers 13.33, who aren't Nephilim, as the exaggerated part of the report says. They're actually, as Deuteronomy 2, giants, but Raphaim giants. You should take that back to Hebrew. And so giants nonetheless, but not the antediluvian giants, which were larger. Uh, and Arba is the patriarch of these giants that's li listed in the book of Joshua, and he's not in the table of nations either. So these nine patriarchless nations uh, have Raphaim patriarchs. So what happens after the flood in the land of the covenant is that, and I think even starting at the time of uh, right after the curse to Ham and after Canaan is born and becomes an adult, he's going to provide women as Cain did before the flood to the Valim in that area, the ruling gods to create the Raphaim giants as offspring of human females and a fallen angel as the sort of typical um, biblical understanding is. Although in the polytheist cultures, 
female gods did that, as with Gilgamesh. Um, and so you also have uh, the importance of this matriarchal bloodline that I talk about in book one as used as the start of a new dynasty. So when you wanted to start a new dynastic bloodline, you would have to have a pure fairy uh, owl queen uh, with the uh, matriarchal allegory versus the dragon owl or raven bloodline of the patriarchal uh, to start a new dynasty. And so I think Nimrod intermarried with a female uh, giant as well uh, to create an offspring uh, or he may have even uh, done it with a, uh, a female angel, but we don't get that biblically. So uh, what, what he did start dynastic bloodlines, uh, and they seem to be, in some accounts, not quite as pure as the Raphaim. So it seems to be a hybrid one. So do we get a creation of the hybrids biblically and a new dynasty? Yes, we do. So in Genesis 36, which is an add-on to the table of nations in Genesis 10 or First Chronicles, it's not in the table of nations because of what's going on in Genesis 36. This is the Dukes of Edom. These are the Horim giants, red-haired, hazel eyes, pale skin, as I'll take descriptions back for people to give you that veracity of that description in, in book two. He's going to have a daughter named Timna, so a purebred Horim who's going to intermarry with Eliphaz, son of Esau, brother of Jacob, who changed his name to Israel, who took all of his birthrights, blessings, and magiatic blessing away. And they start these this, this eponymously named race. Uh, and he has taken his name from the Amalekim that shows up in Genesis 14, hundreds of years before Genesis 36, from the Amalekim. And his name is Amalek. And he starts this great Amalekite nation. They're going to go to Petra and live amongst the Amalekim, as I cover in detail in book two. And this is a new dynasty, and they're the ones who are waiting for Israel to come out of Egypt after the uh, after Pharaoh has been humbled and lets them go, and they're going to wipe them from the face of the earth. And in doing so, legally in Old Testament law, they would get all of the birthright inheritance. They would get the blessings and the inherit the magianic If they were promise. successful. If, if they, they were successful. successful. Yeah. And that was part of the motivation to, to do that. So we get those hybrids that are listed in the Bible. And I give some outside accounts of how do we know that they were actually giants as well as biblical accounts. So in Numbers 13, uh, you get these people other than the Anakim kings, Talmai, Sheshai, and Ahiman, uh, these Canaanite tribes who are taller and stronger and more numerous than Israel. And then those details are verified in Deuteronomy 1. And so these are the hybrids there. They're taller. They're seven to nine feet tall. And how do we know that? From the execration text, the Egyptians called these Canaanites Shazu. And they lived amongst the Anakim and other giant kings in the covenant land. And they give the dimensions of them as seven to nine feet tall. Okay, so uh, just back to my original question: What I don't know if it's even possible to figure this out, but what percentage of us right. uh, are do not have uh, Nephilim or Raphaim or any of the bloodlines uh, yeah. blood in us? How many of us are more more than more than not? So yes, there was intermarriage, but they don't want it too diluted, right? So they want to control it because that's where they get their superiority from. So one of the measurements that we can take is, is that, for example, the Windsors have O negative blood. So typically the Royals have RH negative blood. And so about 15% of the population has RH negative blood. And RH negative, uh, you know, by definition is missing um, of the D is missing an antigen um, and that's where the negative comes from and the D antigen. And so you have this understanding that it can't just be the bloodline that makes the conclusion because you can't add something to something to the bloodlines if something's missing. Right. So, okay. 
is, is sort of the, it's the gene that you have to focus on. And I call it the gene of Isis in, in book one and the Elvin gene. And then two specific ones that I'll talk about more in book two is the LB gens, which is basically meaning pale white uh, as the skin color of, of most of the giants and gens as being a specific patriarch. So it's the genealogy to a specific patriarch, just as the Julia gens is the gens of the black nobility of the older black nobility, as opposed to the newer black nobility. There's two sections in there of the Royals in Italy, and they take their bloodlines as the Julia gens back through Julius Caesar, Augustus, and back to Romulus and Remus through the Senator families. And so it's so not track the, those genes. It's not the bloodline. It's the gene. It's the gene. That's yes. If you could and be that, RH negative. That doesn't mean that you're, you know, part fallen angel. In other words. Yes, it does not mean that. And even and even if you were, it, from a salvation perspective, that was my next question. It's meaningless. Uh, we all have free choice as sentient beings, and from a Christian perspective, if you choose God and you have faith in Jesus, you're going to be saved. So it's not. It's not a physical issue. It's a faith issue. Got it. All right. Another time out. Gary Wayne stays with us back with more in a moment. Hi there. If you want to watch the rest of these episodes, please head over to my Rumble channel, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. You can watch complete episodes there. New, complete, unedited episodes drop every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Again, the Rumble channel is Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. In the meantime, I want to thank you for supporting this YouTube channel all of these years. However, the problem is I never know when I'm going to run afoul of the censors at YouTube. I never know when I'm going to end up in YouTube jail. There doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason. And in fact, two more strikes and this YouTube channel will be taken down altogether. So help me fight big tech censorship. Enjoy the complete unedited episodes and join the rest of the Strange Planet community over on Rumble. Again, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet on rumble.com. See you over there. Gary Wayne is with us, the Genesis 6 Conspiracy Part 2, and uh, the URL is in the episode description, but it's uh, genesis6conspiracy.com, genesis, the numeral 6, conspiracy.com, and you can get um, kind of a nice um, uh, breakdown of the different sections for both the books, the Genesis 6 Conspiracy uh, with uh, all eight sections kind of summarized and with the uh, Genesis 6 Conspiracy Part 2, I believe there are seven sections uh, there. You get the breakdown uh, uh, of each of those as well. Um, so you were saying even if you have the genetic composition, uh, it's it's not a physical um, uh, de uh, determinant. It is a spiritual one or a faith-based one. So it's for salvation, yes. Any indication that any of these um, um, not bloodlines, but uh, let's say, for example, the royal family in England. Do you see any indication there that um, the Windsors um, have a, a sincere faith in in Jesus Christ, and that they are not, uh, let's say, you know, in league with the fallen angels? Yeah. So, I mean, it's hard to get inside their head, right? But um, you know, Queen Elizabeth was a member of, uh, and she has her own Royal Masonic order of the order of the garter. And there's mm -hmm. a lower level that they reward politicians with. And then there's the Royal order above that sort of a standard sort of structure. She also sat on the table of the, uh, order of the golden fleece. Um, that's currently in the table that she sat on there. Cause there's three different Anjou bloodlines all claiming the King of Jerusalem title that I cover in, in book one and, and a little more in book two. The one that's recognized is the, and the word the queen sat on, is the uh, 
order of the Anjou that King Philippe of France or, or of Spain currently holds and holds the King of Jerusalem title and has his uh, royal order. And that's where her and other royals also sit at. But also understand that um, there's a von Habsburg mm -hmm. Anjou order that's a rival for it. And then a Savoy bloodline issue out of Naples, all Anjou that are trying to claim this King of Jerusalem title that goes back to Baldwin II in 1118, crowned in a small priory uh, on the Rock of Sion. Um, and so anyways, it's it's come down through history to there. So there's that and that they do believe in this divine inheritance that they swear the oath to. Uh, I'm not saying all all royals are, are polytheist. Uh, I think it's very difficult not to be part of a royal family. And at that level, every member family, if you're part of the family, you're going to have specific roles you have to do. And if you're part of the surrounding family uh, as the noble elite and pure bloodlines, you're going to have specific roles in all of these organizations as well. So it's hard to not be part of it, but there are ones that, that, that do leave. Um, and they do believe they have higher levels of intelligence. And surveys say that RH negative bloodline and again, I have a great document on this, uh, you know, the genes and how it skips generations and some of the traits and, you know, higher levels of intelligence means 135 plus. They have higher, better analytical capabilities, more psychic abilities, lower body temperature, lower blood pressure, higher percentages of blonde and red hair, higher percentages of blue and green eyes and uh, more uh, occult uh, experiences. Uh, so there's there's physical traits that manifest, but again, it's not a physical. You're not going to be judged for innocently inheriting physical attributes. So you have that choice. And even if there was, it wouldn't go past the fourth generation because there's Old Testament law that says the sins of the father don't pass on beyond the third or fourth generation. So, but there is this bloodline, and they're still around. And biblically, we get these bloodlines talked about in the bible and there is a specific bloodline so and i think what we're seeing is is a return back to that system in preparation for the end time so if people were looking for a passage on how we know there's a specific seed line that we need to be aware of i would first of all direct people to psalms 21 8 through 11 and there, in, in a paraphrasing, it's talking about in the time of anger and wrath in the end time. So he says that their fruits is going to be destroyed from the earth and their seed from amongst the children of men. And there are other passages as well that deal with the terrible ones. And then Daniel 2.43, uh, where the descendants and or new giants, depending on how you want to understand the metallic end time prophecy there, uh, of the and I call it Metallica's gold head, silver, bronze, iron, iron and clay, as we get through that, where it says they're going to mingle themselves with the seed of men in the end time. So we know there's a bloodline. We know what the royals do by keeping their genealogies. We know what the meaning of royal means. We know what the meaning of rex duus, 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 deus or deus is. We know that they do the divine right of inheritance. They know we know that they continually try and intermarry to keep those bloodlines pure, and they continually add new dynastic bloodlines through selective intermarriage throughout their history. We know that they continue to control most of the wealth in the world and pull most of the strings. And so it's harder not to believe that, that, that from a from the minimalist perspective is that it's what they believe and whether or not it's true or not that they have those genealogies it's what they do with that belief that's important and you know when charles was a prince the prince of wales uh he uh, said that he had genealogies that went back to vlad the impaler whom dracula is based on right. who was a classic noble giant celt red hair hazel eyes, pale skin, drank blood, you know, and you get the viper uh, teeth in there, or the snake teeth, and you have Dracula, which means son of a dragon uh, mm -hmm. that the Vlad is based on. And uh, that goes back to Greek, Greek Draconta for watcher, as in watcher angel. Ah. <laughs> and 
Vlad the Impaler takes his bloodlines back to a tribe of Hercules as part of the Herculides dynasty bloodline. And obviously, with Hercules being the top of that as a Nephilim patriarch after the flood, son of Zeus and alchemy. So there's lots of information out there on that. It's just hard to get, but you can you can put the pieces together. Are all these uh, uh, bloodlines, are they competing with one another still? or And, and at what yes. point do they unite uh, in anticipation of the, the second coming? Well, they don't really unite. Uh, they work uh, in a rival rivalry way for the same agenda. They want to bring on the end time, but there can only be one dynastic ruler that's going to win. It's like the Highlander series, mm -hmm. you know, where they take their heads and there can be <laughs> only one. Yeah. yeah, and they do it through the matriarchal allegories versus the patriarchal dragon allegories. Um, so there's not blood drinking, but they get the the quickening spirit, as as they would call it, entering into them and. So, yeah, they're going to be working together and you're going to see all sorts of disunity in it, just as we see today. So you see Putin pushing back, you see Xi pushing back, and they it's not that they don't want a new world order that they've already established as being 10 dominions. Um, just as you have 10 kings of Atlantis before the flood, because nothing is new under the sun. What was what was will be again. And that you get these same 10, ten kings, horns, toes prophesied in the Bible that rule at the end to bring about. They just want a larger role. They don't want the role that the Western European bloodlines are trying to impose on the world. And they use the U.S. as their attack dog to do their will because they don't like to get their hands dirty or spend their wealth. Um, so there's going to be that pushback all the way through until this happens. And, and the UN has a separated into 10 groups as well, a couple of different maps, just as the club of Rome that answers into the committee of the 300 on the Thelemic trunk of the, of the Thelemic tree organizational structure of these secret societies and bloodline orders um, go. And that, there's been vicious retaliation against each other to try and establish a smaller set of rival bloodlines. And you saw that in the family war of World War One. Yeah. And all the cousins fighting each other. All the yeah. So as the real rival of the Western European bloodlines, the uh Romanov bloodline, which is the Putyanin bloodline the original czars of kiev and they set up with vladimir the great in about a thousand a.d the moscow branch and then through intermarriage the junior offshoot house of the putyanin the romanovs just as the plantagenet is a junior offshoot of the anjou um, through marriage in 1600 took over the russian throne so they took out the romanovs by creating social masonry and launching that on russia and then they had to create national socialism to try and stop the communists who got out of control that went rogue on them and then national socialism got out of control and then the western banks who were also an answer into through the rothschilds and their stable of agents into the thelemic tree at the committee of 300 as well um they had to you know defeat the nazis but with that you had the kaiser bloodline basically topple or and and go back into uh you know not being seen and you had uh as an outcome of that the Habsburg dynasty being weakened through those two wars and taking a very much sort of in behind the scenes role as well and then they launched communism on the dragon bloodlines of China from the dragon creator gods of the Xia dynasty XIA and so the two major bloodlines of the Eastern and the Western bloodlines of the Shah dynasties were the Lees, which is, you know, the most common name in China. But in the power levels, Lees are everywhere, curling triads and secret societies, just as it's done in the West. And the Western bloodline is the X. I bloodline, the Xi bloodline, and you have Xi on the throne today, who is going to be starting to establish his empire. And I think you'll see this split into 
two groups of five that are at odds with each other that will come together as the, as the ruling 10, but it will not be a totally unified group. Is there anywhere in the world where the leadership are not part of the, one of these dynasties or bloodlines? Not How, really. Like, what not about really? Yeah. What about Javier Malay in Argentina? He seems like a, yeah. a, a man of the people. Yeah. So we don't, you know, we haven't seen all the bloodlines sort of resurge, but they're there. So in South America, the royal bloodline is the Inga Roca. And there's, they're quite visible. And most people think whether it was the Inga or the Inca bloodlines or the Aztec or the Mayan and all, all the different names of the First Nations in Central and South America, that those bloodlines were wiped out when the Spanish and the Portuguese um, came. Actually, they weren't. It was just the, the king whose head was chopped off um, and, and killed. And then, you know, by the mid-1520s, both Portugal and Spain authorized in proclamation to reassert the privilege and the nobility class of the royals, and then there, they started an intermarriage. So, yes, there was a lot that were wiped out because of disease and things like that, but I would be expecting descendants of those bloodlines to get more closer to the power levers as we get closer to the end time. So there's still a lot of things to be worked out, and we're not quite as close to the end time as some people would say, like it's like next year or What's going on in Gaza today is start of World War III. That's going to lead our no. We're going to see more of that, and the geopolitical thing still is playing out as part of the Soros. Uh, just very quickly, last question: How far then? What is the timetable uh, for for the uh, the end times? Yeah, so we want to be careful because everybody who's put specific dates and things on it, you know, there's like a graveyard of these sort of false prophets, right, so to speak. Um, but there is a generation that Jesus speaks about, and it's a fig tree generation. And the fig tree is akin to the fig tree that Jesus killed um, before, just towards the end of his commission and before he laid out his end time chronology that's laid out in Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 17, and 21. And in there, there's the fig tree generation uh, that when you see it back in bloom, and that's a reference to the southern kingdom. And in the Old Testament, in prophetic allegory that's used to describe Israel, you have the vine for the lost northern kingdom, and the fig tree is the southern kingdom. And so there's a generation where all the events are going to be fulfilled. And he says, heaven and earth will pass away, but his words won't pass away. So it's in stone uh, as 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 the as the Messiah and the Redeemer. So a generation can be understood as 40 years in the time of Leviticus and the Exodus and the generation in the wilderness. Um, and 70 years in the book of Psalms. And then I would also include in on the mix 120 years, Genesis 6, 3, when life was limited to 120 years because of the immortal spirit that was put into the Nephilim. Uh, and that that immortal spirit doesn't die, but the body would die. So the lifespan of the body. So maximum 120 years. So when do we use as a starting point for end time prophecy? Well, when the Southern Kingdom is back in the land, which was 1947, uh, the declaration and the war in 1948, but I think more importantly in control of Jerusalem. Because so 67 then, 67. Probably 67. And so 40 years isn't probably appropriate here because we would be by that if that is the start. And that is the big if, if, if that is the start of the last fig tree generation, then it would be 70 or 120 years. So if it's 70 years, we're getting to the end of that 70 years where the last seven would be tagged on, as Daniel 9 talks about, 927 specifically, uh, for those last seven years where all vision and prophecy and commitments and the coming of Christ um, is uh, to be fulfilled. So things would have to heat up a lot to get things on track there. So it may be beyond that, but it doesn't have to be a full 120 years, right? It's just within that generation. So I think 
we're seeing the signs. I think we're in the sorrows and those sorrows of catastrophe, of pestilence, uh, earthquakes, uh, wars and rumors of wars and famine have to get stronger and start working together. So that comes out of the geopolitical wars that we're starting to see heat up. We've seen the, con and these are all contrived catastrophes. It's not God's judgment. These are contrived. Uh, we bring it on ourselves in this world. We've seen what happened with the last pestilence as lightly been created. Um, I think stronger than that, but I'll leave it at that. Um, and Famines will come out of that, but wars create shortages. I mean, just look at the fears that came out of the Ukraine, like yep. if there wasn't going to be enough fertilizer and things like that. Uh, and earthquakes are on the rise already. Uh, I'm not I'm sure it's everything that we're doing to the earth that might be causing that. Or harp, um, perhaps. Yeah. And so they have to get stronger, so much so that before you can get to the last seven years when the seals are being opened, that would be 25% destruction. So you could have the worst war in history that seems like Armageddon, but not even be the seal openings, let alone the trumpets, which is 33%, let alone the year of the wrath bowls, which would be 100%, lest Jesus didn't step in, all flesh would be destroyed. So we have a long ways to go. It's going to look apocalyptic-like because it's the same catastrophes in the sorrows as in the as in the seals as in the trumpets as in the wrath bowls they just get stronger and happen more often and that those who are on this earth that who believe they have these immortal spirits that aren't allowed into heaven they're not looking for a world that's good for humans that disembodied spirit would survive the destruction of the world right and so when you bring in their belief system of the shiva doctrine or the destroyer doctrine a bad Napoleon, uh, as uh, this destroyer is called in in Revelation nine, that I think is Azazel, and I link that back in book two as well. Um, the doctrine of Shiva is is that it not only is Shiva a destroyer god, but a creator god, and it renews the earth after destruction. So. The other analogy of the occult that goes along with it is the phoenix rising out of the ashes. And with the angelic technology that we're seeing handed down to us today, that's wrapping us up to be like the days of Noah, this time destruction by fire versus water, is that there will be sleeves, as some terms, and I think a TV show is called Alter Carbon talked about, uh, clone bodies, maybe a combination of chimera bodies as revelation nine war would show those chimera bodies. And that's a Greek technology, angelic technology, and a name that comes out of prehistory. Um, and, or some form of uh, ability to give them a physical body in a new world where they can just transfer that consciousness or the soul as they like to speak versus the spirit, which is what they're really referring to uh, into a body that they could live in this world and without humans, because they were created to wipe us from the face of the earth and make sure that we don't reach our destiny um, as a justification for the angelic rebellion. So I know we're, we're coming to the end of time. I'll just sort of wrap it up in one of the things that, uh, Christians aren't taught because we're not taught prehistory and prophecy in churches. We're also not taught just the context of how that is part of the values, but it does not teach our resonatra, our, our reason for being. Adamites were created as a resolution to the angelic rebellion. The fallen angels in response have been trying to make sure that we would not reach our destiny ever since. Wow. That's a, um... An amazing summation. Uh, the Genesis 6 Conspiracy Part 2, How Understanding Prehistory and Giants Helps Define End-Time Prophecy. Gary, thank you so much. Great speaking with you again. Terrific. It's uh, been an honor and a pleasure, and invite me back anytime. I shall. Thank you. Hi there. If you want to watch the rest of these episodes, please head over to my Rumble channel, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. You can watch complete episodes there. New, complete 
unedited episodes drop every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Again, the Rumble channel is Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. In the meantime, I want to thank you for supporting this YouTube channel all of these years. However, the problem is I never know when I'm going to run afoul of the censors at YouTube. I never know when I'm going to end up in YouTube jail. There doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason. And in fact, two more strikes and this YouTube channel will be taken down altogether. So help me fight big tech censorship. Enjoy the complete unedited episodes and join the rest of the Strange Planet community over on Rumble. Again, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet on Rumble.com. See you over there.